welcome everyone to the future, um, where we have the opportunity to get scared, <laughs> um, to troll people, <laughs> or to scare old ladies. Um, but this isn't it, right? This isn't all that virtual reality was meant to be, some novel experience, uh, some way to scare people, some way to troll people. It's not all just about gaming, is it? Uh, I would posit that it's not, and to answer that question and to better answer it, uh, we're gonna go back to 1967, uh, to something called trolleyology. And if anybody here is a psychologist, you may have heard of this. It is a thought experiment or study which asks the question, imagine yourself on a bridge and imagine a trolley approaching five people tied down to the trolley tracks. Uh, there is someone in front of you that does not know that you were there behind them. The only way to save those five people that are tied to the trolley tracks is to push that person over the ledge, stopping the trolley. In essence, killing one person to save five people. Asking the question, are people willing to be active participants in killing someone in the midst of potentially saving five other people? Since 1967, that thought experiment has exploded into lots of different permutations to study how we make moral decisions uh, inside of these types of constraints. So where there is limited time and there are lives on the, on the line. How do we make moral decisions? Uh, asking the question, what if these were your family members? What if they were all male? What if they were all female? What if they were children? And by studying people's reactions to that, we were able to understand better moral decision making. However, over the past decade or so, this thought experiment has started to, to come out of popularity because it is armchair psychology. You're essentially asking someone sitting in a nice, comfortable leather chair how they would react in a situation where lives are on the line and when time is running out. And that's really hard to place yourself in a very hypothetical situation. And we're not going to actually create a real situation where five people's lives are on the line and you're actually going to shove someone over the edge of a bridge. Um, so that's where it started to kind of come out of popularity because we stopped learning much um, as a result of the, the difference in experience. Um, however, in today's day and age, we have the opportunity to better emulate senses. Uh, and so some students at Carnegie Mellon created a virtual reality experience of trolleyology, studying how the difference of adding senses and trying to emulate better a hypothetical situation, how people might respond differently. So one of the studies that they did was in this VR experience where you are, it's a little bit different, but you're uh, actually asked to uh, flip a switch and send it towards one person having a picnic on the trolley tracks, which I don't know why they would be doing that, um, or to have it uh, kill five workers that are unaware that a trolley is approaching them. Um, and what they did is study how people responded in that experience inside of a virtual reality experience where they're seeing this happen in real time, and in front of them they're able to look around and actually grab a lever and pull it. Um, they also did another experiment where uh, there's an elevator shaft dropping. Uh, and five people are in it, and there is a worker that if you shove him down into the elevator shaft, you complete an electrical circuit, killing that person, but stopping the elevator from falling. Uh, and they actually put a real person in front of this person in the VR experience and tested to see how people responded differently if they felt a real live human being breathing that they were about to push down to their death. And they saw a drop from 55% that were willing to do that, to kill somebody to save five other people when they didn't feel someone, uh, and down to 25% when they actually felt a real life human being that they weren't willing to do that. All this goes to say is that by adding more senses to experiences, the more that we change our reaction and interaction with uh, content, with experiences, and the way that we experience reality. Um, and so it's not just looking at something on a screen, it's no longer armchair psychology. Uh, and going back to this trolleyology example, kind of goes to my argument, which is that virtual reality and the future of it is not all about gaming. It's not a novelty. It's not just about scaring people and getting reactions and experiences out of them, but there's much, much more. Uh, and that's what I want to talk about today is, is the future of that and specifically how the web uh, and standardization inside of the web is going to open up those possibilities to make it more than just a novelty, more than just a gaming experience. So the things that I want to talk about is why this matters to this group. Uh, why am I talking about this in Inbound? Why am I talking about it in the context of, of marketing? Uh, then I'm going to cover the current state of technology from initial production to distribution and how people can currently create um, virtual reality experiences and virtual reality content and then get it to consumers and audiences. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about where the web comes in and why I think that opens up possibilities and ideas in ways that we can leverage virtual reality. 
uh, and talk specifically about browser support and where that is now and where it will be in the next coming even months, um, and especially the next year. And then talk more about ideas for uh, integration and, and ways that the web will open that up. Uh, we're going to look at some current examples of how people are leveraging virtual reality both as destinations and experiences as well as mechanisms or tools. Um, and then also think about what that can mean for the future once we get it inside of the browser. Uh, and then lastly, have some time for Q&A. Um, so to dig in, just a little bit of background and introduction. Uh, my name is Zach Robbins, and I'm on the strategy team um, at an agency called Vigit. Uh, there's a whole website dedicated to how you save Vigit because it is confusing. You can go to savevigit.com and play a little game. Um, and I'm on our strategy team, and so I help uh, our clients think through how to connect technology, specifically web technology, to consumers and audiences, whether that's through creative content experiences or editorials or products or tools. Um, and I'm one of just over 60 people that is thinking through that from designers to developers uh, to people that are focused on research and analytics. Um, for a slew of clients across industries, um, such as in the nonprofit space, World Wildlife Fund, um, larger brands like ESPN, Politico, and Puma, um, to startups um, and technology companies as well. And most recently, uh, got the opportunity to launch this experience for ESPN this weekend. Uh, for those of you that follow the NBA, you know that LeBron James entered the top 10 scorers of all time. Uh, and so over the past several weeks, we worked on a interactive experience, scrolling through his entire career of uh, points um, and how he entered the top 10 and projecting how he might actually become the number one all-time score and when he would do that in his lifetime. And in this experience, one pixel equals one point. So it's a long scrolling experience, scrolling over 38,000 points of his, of his career. Um, so to, to d jump into the talk in, in terms of why this matters and why I'm talking about, which I'll touch on briefly. Um, inbound is about experiences, and I've had these conversations over the past couple of days with people. Uh, that it's not just about trying to get people somewhere and saying, I completed this task. They got to the page, therefore I succeeded. Uh, the goal is actually to give them an experience that they enjoy, that they engage with, that they spend time with, and that they want to share. Uh, and so the real focus of, of getting creative, of, of doing a good job, is not just getting them to the page, it's getting them to engage with it. It's getting it to be something that they enjoy. Um, and so creating experiences and as not just content, content is just a mechanism uh, to create an experience for a user, whether they're engaging in that with text or images or video, it's all just a medium uh, to give them some form of experience to communicate an idea or to communicate something that they wanna share with other people. Um, and virtual reality is specifically a marketing vehicle. It's a way to get across an idea. It's a way to sell a product. It's a different medium or a mechanism to talk about what it is that you do, the product that you sell, um, or just the thoughts that you're trying to share. Uh, it's a different way for people to engage with that. As we saw in the early example of trolleyology, adding more senses, specifically in virtual reality, and actually putting someone in the shoes or in, in a situation changes the way that they engage with that and changes the experience itself. Uh, so it can be a marketing vehicle, not just a destination of a game that I wanna play to escape reality, but something to actually engage with reality in a different way. Uh, and lastly, it is a destination in and of itself. Because it is new and upcoming, people want to engage with it just for that fact. Uh, if you throw a bunch of Google Cardboards at people, they're going to eat them up, and they're going to try and go download some apps to experience it, uh, because it is new. People want to see what virtual reality is all about. If you have Expo Centers and you have an Oculus Rift, there will be a long line to try to experience the Oculus Rift, because they've heard about it, and they've seen those reaction GIFs, and they want to know, what is that like? What is it like to experience virtual reality? So there is some novelty which we can capitalize on in the sense of just making something virtual reality or having a virtual reality extension of a piece of content or experience will make it in and of itself more shareable, more engaging, and more enjoyable. So to jump into how people can currently create VR content, how they can distribute it where we're at now. It's come a long way in the past several years. So I was having a conversation with, some, with someone last night and asking, how do you actually create VR video, specifically 360 video. There are now a lot more ways that you can do it than you used to be able to do it. This is an example of a GoPro setup using eight GoPros and a cube. Um, and so it simultane simultaneously captures all of those views, and then you can later stitch those together into a 360 experience. And we'll actually look at an example later on um, of what one of those experiences looks like, uh, created by Patron. Uh, there are cameras now for two to $300 where you can capture 360 video, 360 photos. Obviously, the production quality of, of a few hundred dollar camera is going to be different from a $5,000 camera, but the fact is you can create that content uh, currently for, for a lot cheaper than you could two or three years ago. And two or three years from now, that's gonna be inevitably cheaper as well as higher production quality for that price point. Uh, so it's not just for high-end production shops, it's for any in-house marketing team um, or a small agency that can, that can create 360 video. 
Uh, also, editing software is catching up. So Adobe Premiere Pro and Adobe After Effects allows for 360 uh, viewing experiences and stitching together. Um, so Adobe is catching up in terms of realizing that 360 video is a future and is the future of how we engage with video in a new way. And so they want to give you the tools to be able to edit that well. Um, and then what if you don't have a real experience that you want people to engage with, but a fake experience or a 3D experience that is created in an alternate world? Uh, you can use tools like Unity to create 3D worlds. You can use free models that you can find online to get started. Uh, you can create maps and textures. Um, you can also use other 3D modeling programs such as 3ds Max uh, and Cinema 4D to create 3D experiences that end up being displayed inside of uh, a VR experience. So Unity is probably the most popular for that because of how it distributes across devices and across uh, different um, applications. Uh, and then you actually have to get it in front of people. So people have to be able to engage with it somehow. And this is where we start to see the explosion of devices and how people can consume VR content. Um, everything from the Oculus Rift to the, the Vive to the HoloLens to PlayStation VR to down to the cardboard, which I have one sitting right there. Uh, and you have obviously a different range of production. You have a different platform for the Oculus versus uh, something like Google Cardboard. Here are my notes. Thank you. Um, and then you have um, everything in between. So Samsung uh, VR or gear is just essentially a more expensive version of cardboard. Um, so when it comes to the high-end experiences, you have the Oculus Rift. Um, and, and this is where uh, experiences can be really engaging and fun, and this is more of an escape from reality. They do have a browser inside of Oculus Rift, uh, but it in no way emulates virtual reality. It's essentially just browsing the internet like you would on a desktop uh, with a mouse, and you can click on pages and read content that way, which to me is not at all compelling. Um, but this uh, limits the number of people that can engage with content. So are you going to invest in creating content on a platform that only so many people have access to because it's at a $600 price point point, has to be hooked up to a really expensive computer? Probably not. So on the other end of the spectrum, you have Google Cardboard and specifically distributing through native applications. Uh, so stick this in a cardboard. So VRSE is a good example of a VR app that has VR content. Um, and then it splits your view into um, two videos, which interacts with the lenses inside of the cardboard, um, which, which then can distribute VR content through either platforms like this, or you can create your own application uh, if you're a big expensive media company like Discovery or New York Times and invest in your own distribution model. Uh, and right now, really native applications is the best way that we're seeing uh, people engage with VR content kind of on an accessible scale. And what I'm gonna talk about is when we start to move out of native applications into, into lessening the barrier to entry of all I have to do is go to somewhere in my browser or click on a link on my phone and I can actually engage with that experience. Um, and then on the, the other end of the, the spectrum on the completely free, you don't need a device, scale is YouTube, which supports 360 degree um, video, which you can click and drag around or you can actually throw into a Google Cardboard device and be able to experience. Currently, you can only do that uh, in the Google Cardboard experience through their app, you can't do it uh, inside of a browser, so you can't go to youtube.com or the mobile view of youtube.com uh, and do that. Um, but I would contend that these are still just one-way conversations. Because they are stuck inside of a native application, they're stuck inside of a platform, um, and specifically, we're telling someone a story from start to finish, um, and the only thing that they can do right now is just look around um, and, and emulate like they're inside of that experience. But they can't necessarily interact and change the way that that story is told, or jump around in the timeline, or change the timeline entirely, or move around to a different part of the experience, or move around to the different part of the world. And I think that when we start to open up accessibility into a browser and into other technologies, that's when we start to see more than just one-way conversations, telling a story in a different way, but creating completely different interactive experiences, uh, which is where I think the internet, and specifically the browser and the web, comes into play. Um, so just looking at numbers and why this matters in terms of scale. Uh, so you look at something like the Oculus Rift, uh, and there are no current sales numbers on how many they've sold, but the current estimates at around 100,000. Um, obviously, it's expensive, so it's difficult to try to get people to shell a lot of change for it, as well as it's new. Um, however, it will always still be a relatively low portion of the market because of the price point. Take a step further back, um, and you have Google Cardboard, or in this case, a more expensive version of Cardboard, and Samsung actually reports their sales numbers, and they've sold over 1 million Gear VR. Um, and so already you have an exponentially larger market of people that have cheaper uh, devices but can engage in different ways through a native application and not through a specific platform. Take a step even further back and you have all smartphone users, which is almost two billion people. Um, and so people that can download a native application, uh, 
that's your market, and that's the people that you can reach right now, um, as well as people that you can reach on the go through a mobile browser. Now, you might be asking, but not everybody has a Google Cardboard. Uh, I would contend two things. First, Google Cardboards are becoming like candy. They're being handed out at events. New York Times has sent Google Cardboards to all three million of their subscribers, both digital and print. There is an invested interest in getting people into VR experiences, and specifically a cheap version of that, from companies that are distributing that content, as well as just generally people wanting to engage with it. You can go on Amazon and buy one for $15. You can go and buy an Oculus Rift for $600 and a PC for $1,500 that can hook up to it. So the accessibility is already there. So I would contend that this is not a barrier or as big of a barrier to entry as you would think. You take a step even further back and you have all internet users, uh, which is almost half of the entire world population that has access to the internet. You go to experiences like YouTube where, sure, it's not an immersive VR experience, but it is a 360 experience and you can choose potentially how to interact inside of a story or how to change the story itself uh, inside of a desktop browser and inside of just the internet alone. Um, and so it is important, it does matter, and it does open up the possibilities of the people that we can reach and the ways that we can reach them uh, by making it more accessible to more people. So I'm gonna talk a little about browser support and where we are now. Uh, and the fun thing about pitching a talk for technology is that you pitch that six months in advance for technology that is changing in a matter of weeks. Um, so this is fun because what I initially plan to talk about in browser support is even better. Um, so let's take a step back to HTML5, uh, which was uh, finally published or released officially uh, in October of 2014, which enabled the ability to uh, embed directly different media types inside of the browser. Before you had to rely on Flash, which everyone hates, um, because it is a plugin, it is always outdated, it always crashes your computer, and it isn't accessible on every device. So HTML5 opened up the possibility um, of embedding media directly inside of the browser and being able to interact with it in a better way that was based on open standards. Uh, take a step a little further down the line and you have WebGL. Uh, so before, browsers could only use the CPU to uh, power graphics. And so you were limited in terms of what you could do and your computer would still heat up a lot when you were watching video. Uh, but WebGL came along and allowed you to tap into the graphics processor, which enabled things like 3D drawing within the browser that doesn't kill your computer. And phones are now powerful enough to do that using WebGL as well, which is all based on HTML5. Uh, so now we have the ability to do a lot more inside of the browser, not just embed media, but also draw 3D objects and display it in a way that doesn't kill computers or phones. And now comes the fun part of the talk that I didn't plan on talking about until a month ago, which is a, a standard called WebVR. Uh, WebVR is a new standard that will be released in the next version of Chrome and the next version of Firefox, which standardizes the way that you can display VR content inside of a browser. You can currently tap into it using a polyfill. For people that do responsive website design, you remember polyfills when we couldn't use media queries in CSS3. Um, it was a way to tap into a, an upcoming standard through um, essentially telling the browser, or tricking the browser into thinking that it was standardized. Um, so WebVR is being developed by some of the same people that are behind Google Cardboard and that were behind WebGL. Some folks from Mozilla, some folks from Chrome uh, that are interested in making VR content more accessible to more people and the ways that that opens up in terms of integrations with different technologies. You can find more about it at webvr.info. Uh, you can also download the standard, uh, you can look at the code, uh, and you can follow updates on when it will be released and when it will be published um, and standardized across browsers. Um, one of the early testers or experimenters um, with WebVR specifically goes back to why this matters for marketing, why this matters for inbound, uh, because it's a way for brands to better uh, tell stories, to better uh, immerse people in content and immerse people in experiences in a way that they get to control how that story is told. Uh, so WebVR opens up not only the scale and the number, but the integrations, um, which is where I think things really open up. So when we think about integrations and why it matters if it's not on an Oculus platform, but inside of a standard browser, you can now tap into technologies that are built in open source, JavaScript, HTML5, and CSS3. So even looking at JavaScript, uh, 3GS. So we'll look at an example of a 3GS VR experience based in WebVR in just a second, which allows you to draw using JavaScript in 3D. So you don't have to have a, an expensive 3D modeling program in order to do it. All you have to do is know how to write JavaScript and specifically know how to write in 3GS, which anybody can learn. Um, and the number of frameworks, JavaScript frameworks and JavaScript libraries and APIs that you can tap into and just learn JavaScript and learn that API and library and be able to write it for free. Just takes time to learn it. Same goes for HTML5 and all of the different ways that we can integrate with different types of media, like audio. Uh, one of the big questions for 
um, UI or UX as it pertains to VR is how do we direct people? We can't tell them exactly where to look. They have the ability to look wherever. We can't give them buttons. We can't give them a navigation. How do we do that? One way to do that is through audio, by pointing people where to, where to look uh, based on where they're looking or where they're at inside of the experience. The ability of HTML5 integration allows for us to do that in a more creative way, because again, we can do it through code. Same goes for CSS3, which will allow us to animate, make transformations, uh, make transitions, uh, and, and overall make things a lot snappier and prettier uh, and more compelling and engaging so that you're not doing it inside of a, uh, a platform like Unity or a 3D modeling program that is limited in terms of the styling that it can do. You can write code to make it however you want and brand it however you want. Um, and there are, there are companies that are coming at the intersection of any one of these things. So if you think of like uh, a startup generator, which is essentially the intersection of this technology with this consumer platform, with this audience type, you can think of companies that have come out of a combination of 3JS and uh, Babylon, or yeah, Babylon, which is a, or Babel, which is a JavaScript gaming platform, um, and WebVR. There is a company that just does those three things together to create VR games inside of the browser. Uh, so if entire companies are emerging out of intersections of these open technologies, uh, then the possibilities for what we can do are, are endless. So I'll talk a little bit about ideas um, and show some current examples of how people are leveraging it and then talk a little bit about the future of when it actually becomes standardized and when people like yourself start to think creatively about how we can leverage it um, or ideas that relate to our particular field, how it can be even more engaging or compelling than just a game and releasing or escaping from reality. Um, so I'd bucket into, into two categories. One is more destinations or experiences, where people are trying to go just to engage with that content, and that's the end in and of itself. Uh, the other is more a tool or a mechanism in order to learn something or a way to get something else, and it's just a, a better way to tell a story or a better way to engage people. Um, so one example is actually the LA Times, um, and they did an experiment. And so New York Times invested in their own application. They have New York Times VR, which you can download. They invested in sending people Google Cardboards. LA Times didn't want to invest that much because they wanted to wait for standardization and making it more accessible. So instead of creating their own application, uh, they tested a web VR based experience. Um, and this is specifically in investigating and discovering the Gale Crater on Mars, which they drew using 3JS. So they drew Mars and the Gale Crater specifically with JavaScript, which is cool, based on NASA imagery. So I'm going to show you a video. Um, I would do a demo, but technology won't allow it. Um, of what that experience looks like on side of, inside of a web VR experience. And I'm gonna step over here. Okay, maybe you can go to your phones and go to graphics.latimes.com slash Mars hyphen Gale hyphen Crater hyphen VR and experience either now or later uh, as the video doesn't want to, oh, there it goes. Nope. Okay. So we're just gonna skip along and you're gonna get that. It essentially splits the video into uh, two displays. And when you go to the site and go to it on your desktop computer, you can tour around um, inside of the browser on your desktop, or you can say that you want to enter the VR experience and enter into cardboard. Uh, and then it uses audio and 3D text and markers to tell you where to go. Uh, and you click to move through that experience. Uh, and you have a narrator telling you uh, more about the crater. And then about the central mound. And again, this is all happening inside of mobile Chrome browser. Uh, and then more about where the Curiosity River went, and you can look around and see other indicators, like the ancient clays. So I want to talk a little bit about what, um, what the LA Times learned through this experience. So they, they talked a little bit about why they chose to wait um, and not develop their own application and try to distribute content through that. Um, and they saw the same things that I just talked about, which is by building a browser-based application, so specifically an HTML5 app as opposed to something that's in a platform um, or native platform, uh, then more people with modern browsers that are based on WebGL can interact with it and experience it and explore. Uh, so in this case, it was a destination or experience. Content is their product. All they want to do is get people to engage with content, to share it, um, and, and, to sh and to engage with it for a long time, as it, that is their revenue. Their content is their revenue. Um, and so there were some challenges or some limiting factors to doing video or doing web VR based experiences that aren't necessarily challenges that can't be overcome. So as I said earlier, how do you get people to know where to look? 
because they're able to look around. Um, and so one of the issues with WebVR specifically is that you can't get the Chrome of the browser to go away. So if you saw in the video, you still had the status bar, you still had um, the actual URL eating up a lot of screen real estate. And when phone screens are so small, that real estate is very expensive, that real estate is very uh, important. Um, so in order to get rid of that right now, you have to install um, the site itself as a bookmark on your phone as an app, and it essentially gets rid of the status bar, but users don't necessarily know to do that. But I imagine that some of the people behind Mozilla and Chrome who are investing in WebVR are figuring out ways that this will no longer be a limiting factor. Uh, and then secondly is that we only have one input for interaction. So you don't have a mouse that you get to go around with, you don't have navigation, you don't have hover states, uh, you essentially just have one touch or tap with a Google Cardboard where you have the one click. So how do we get people to engage with an experience when all they have to do is tap in order to tell it to move along or to, to go to the next part of the timeline. Uh, and so these aren't necessarily limiting factors that can't be overcome. I think they're exciting and challenging experiences to figure out how do we leverage technologies, JavaScript, HTML5, CSS3, uh, to make that actually more compelling uh, than using a mouse and using a navigation to move around. Uh, another example, we'll see if this loads, is Patron, um, who created a VR experience using a GoPro setup and a custom drone uh, to emulate, I'm getting no audio, there we go, great. As Patron has grown, we've stayed true to our artisanal tequila making process. But unless you've been to the hot sand in person, you may not know that Patron is made by hand in small batches. So we kept it the whole process in virtual reality so people could experience the art of Patron firsthand. Early on, we were inspired by Patron's iconic bee emblem. And so we decided to actually tell the story through the eyes of the bee, chasing after this agave plant as it's harvested and transformed into tequila. Let's us take viewers to some unexpected places and really show the art and craft behind Patron. Bringing the story to life meant doing it in a way that had not been done before. We filmed on location in Mexico using a 360 degree camera rig that was attached to a custom made drone to recreate the fielding of flight. We also utilized binaural audio, which captured sounds and placed it in 3D space. We then took all the footage that we shot in Mexico and stitched it all together. We also utilized photoreal CG to put people in places that the camera couldn't go. In the end, we were able to create a seamless, one-of-a-kind experience. When you put on the headset, you become the bee, and you're flying around the Patron Hacienda. It's unlike anything I've ever seen. You're literally forgetting you're a human, and you get the sensation of flying and floating through the air and going across the copper pot stills, and it's just amazing. So much of this process is very, very old, and yet, being told through a technology that is so incredibly new and is so incredibly cutting edge. And it's not just about telling our story, but about honoring the art of crafting tequila. So this was done by an agency called Firstborn, um, and they decided to distribute through YouTube. Um, and so you can go to YouTube and look up Art of Patron, uh, stick it in a Google Cardboard and experience it. Um, so they weren't able to use WebVR, but imagine the possibilities of just sending to someone to a URL instead of telling them to open it up inside of an application or inside of YouTube, um, and then having a desktop experience that coincides with a VR experience. It brings a whole new meaning to responsive. Um, the next example is Merrill. Merrill is launching their newest, most advanced hiking shoe, the Capra. So how do we show people the extreme places this new killer shoe can take them in a new and exciting way? By taking over the Sundance Film Festival with the very first Oculus Rift virtual reality experience that uses motion capture technology so the user is able to walk around in a virtual world. Welcome to the Dolomite. Once that mist clears, head down the bridge. There we are. Yeah. It's a virtual reality experience with a difference. So uh, we've done quite a few virtual reality experiences before, but we've never had a client brave enough to do a walk around one. Make sure you stop at the end and take in that view. What you'll be doing is taking a virtual hike in the Dolomites in Italy, and you'll be going across a particularly wobbly rope bridge. Whoa! 
and then there might be some sort of landslide. And then you might need to find your way to the summit of a mountain. How am I scared in a little hallway and yet it's unbelievable. It was wild man, it was wild. So it's a, it's a virtual reality headset like there are many out there already, but the difference being this time is that we're using a motion capture system. So there's an OptiTrack motion capture system in the entire space. So not only do you have the ability to look around at whatever you like, you can also be tracked in that space. So wherever you go, we can simulate your view inside our technology. That was awesome. It was really cool. 4D elements like the bridge, wind, and the ground shaking made the experience feel even more lifelike. People were amazed. That's yeah, crazy. Was way cooler than I was expecting. It was the most amazing thing ever. Terrified. I'm still walking like this. Literally felt like I was like. That's, that's pretty intense. But actually moving through that space, it's just there's no other feeling like it. Speechless. Yeah. Okay. Holy cow. And most importantly, it made them want to get outside and do it for real. There, guys. Thanks. Um, so that was an example of more event-based marketing, but then they generated a bunch of content off of that. Uh, Discovery did the same thing um, with a VR experience, jumping in the Grand Canyon at South by Southwest, generated a bunch of content, and then distributed that content. It was connected to Gillette. Uh, so telling you that if you sweat, specifically jumping into the Grand Canyon, you should use Gillette. Uh, so branded experience that in some way connects um, to a product, um, and in and of itself is the destination of the content. So I'm gonna go watch that video, or I'm gonna see Instagrams from famous people of them using the Merrill VR experience inside of an event-based context. Uh, the next, which I think is really exciting, is, is how do we think about these as mechanisms or tools? Uh, different ways that we can engage with uh, learning something. Um, and so an example of that, or in the case of Lexus, they use them as product tours. And so we'll see if this comes across uh, but Lexus Europe specifically is invested in a lot of 360 content and videos. Um, and then you can put this into the YouTube application, into your Google Cardboard, and you can emulate what it's like to drive in a Lexus NX. Um, and in this case, it's not displaying in 360 where I can drag around, but you could also do this on a desktop. So if you go to YouTube and search for Lexus Europe 360, you'll find some of these videos and experiences. Um, so what's it like to sit inside of a Lexus? Uh, as opposed to trying to get them to the dealership and actually to test drive a car, this is a little bit of an interesting step. So that's from a marketing perspective and how to get people to experience products in a different way. Uh, but then there's even more examples of how we can use VR to engage with content differently. So medicine uh, is an example of um, a little girl that was born with a congenital heart defect um, and the parents had little uh, options in terms of what they could do. They were essentially told your daughter is going to die. Uh, but uh, they sent around 3D images of her heart to a lot of different hospitals, specifically Nicholas Hospital in Miami, um, and they have almost like a, a development perspective on how they treat working through problems. They have daily stand-ups with their team, and they talk about problems that they're all working on, and so they worked on this problem, and they were going to, th to print a 3D model of her heart to figure out how they could potentially mend it in such a way that would save her life. Uh, the 3D printer that day was broken. Uh, and so they threw it into a web VR based experience inside of the browser, which was easier to do than distributing in a whole application or writing in an iOS or writing in an Android. Um, and they threw it into a browser and then they all took turns looking through the cardboard and they figure out a way to mend her heart because of the way that they were able to see it in 3D space and move around together and talk about the ways that they could potentially do surgery to save her life, which ended up happening. So the ways that we can use VR and specifically easier and more accessible based content through web VR um, can change the way that we think about medicine, the way that we think about saving people's lives. When we think about education, uh, the way that people learn, uh, interesting, if you do a Google search or a Google image search for uh, VR inside the classroom, it actually shows images of people sitting inside of a classroom inside of their VR experience, which I think is the exact opposite of the entire implication, uh, is to get people out of the classroom. So how do we get people not learning through textbooks and not learning through uh, hypothetical examples or scenarios, but how do we actually put them in an environment where they can learn? So if you think about any topic or subject, architecture, history, art, science, uh, chemistry, you can think of examples of using that to train people uh, to learn in a different way uh, that you can't through just text or images or video, which is the current way that we educate. And the, the, the options here, um, I think, are limitless and really exciting. 
Um, so going back to 1967, the exciting part of this talk is that it's at a place where you can go and experiment. Uh, go to webvr.info, you can learn more about that standard, you can learn more about how you can write in 3.js and actually create experiences directly within the browser without going and buying a 360 camera. Uh, because of browser support opening up accessibility in the ways that we can all create content, distribute content, and how people can engage with it. Thank you guys. Uh, please rate my talk on speaker rate. The URL is there. <laughs>